We're fortunate to be joined by legendary investor Jim Rogers, widely regarded as one of the great investors of our generation, or any generation. After co-founding the Quantum Fund in the early 1970s, his portfolio gained 4,200% between 1973 to 1980. Jim, I'm honored to host you and get your insights for our audience today. Welcome. David, I'm honored. Thank you for having me. I'm flattered. Jim, you've talked to me before and you've said that the next crash could possibly be the worst in our lifetime, especially given how much debt we have in our system. And you are correct. We do have a lot of debt on a corporate and national level. Do you think this banking crisis that we're seeing unfolding today could potentially be the catalyst for such a crash? Well, that's part of it. The way these usually things usually work is they start small somewhere, and then the next one, it, it, then it eventually it goes someplace else. It's a bigger crash, a bigger problem the next place, and then another one comes and another one. These things build up. They don't happen in one day. It's that's not the way the world works, David. They always work this way, and eventually, eventually, it makes the evening news. And everybody knows there's a problem. We're not there yet. Jim, you've survived multiple bear markets and multiple crashes in your investing career. Now, this time, how do you compare this to 2008? Very similar on the periphery when we look at it, banking collapses. Is it the same? Is it different? What do you think? Well, I would suspect that this one would be the worst in my lifetime, therefore your lifetime, because the debt is so, so much higher now. I mean, the, America is the largest debtor nation in the history of the world. Look at Japan. I mean, the debt is staggering, goes up every day. So we have huge debts in the world. We've never had anything quite like this in history. So it's got to be pretty horrible. I, I think when some... With any, I don't say that with any joy, David. I'm just, I have to deal with facts. No, I, we appreciate your candor. I think people listening to this would like to know how to survive in case the markets do turn south. Now, how did you outperform the markets by such a significant percentage in the 1970s, especially towards the end of the 70s when we had very high inflation back then? Now, I wasn't around. I read about it in my history books, of course. But today we have relatively high inflation, not nearly as high as the late 70s, but people have compared today to the late 70s. And so my question to you, Jim, how does one outperform the markets in a high inflationary environment? Well, it's the way you always outperform the markets, and that's just stay with what you know. Don't listen to other people. Figure out what you know a lot about, and that's where you put your money. I mean, if you listen to other people and something goes wrong, you don't know what to do because you don't know why you bought in the first place. But if you only invest in what you know, you know what to do if things go right and if things go wrong, and you will still make mistakes, but you'll be ahead of the game. What, in your opinion, was the reason we have so much debt in our economy? Why is it that the governments need to continuously take out more debt? And, of course, corporations as well. Corporate debt is at an all-time high, Jim. Hello, David. If you can solve that problem, wow, they'll be writing books about you for, for centuries. Uh, <laughs> and I think the real reason is because of what happened is countries get like, successful and they start thinking that things are easy and they just buy more debt, get more debt. And since everything is going right, people will lend them more money. And it's a, I mean, it's human nature. I, it's, is it good? No, of course it's not good. It always ends badly. But we're, we're on that same cycle again. Uh, let, me, uh, let me back up and um, look at it, things from a bigger perspective. I remember um, reading one of your quotes from, I believe, uh, Jack Schweiger's book, The Market Wizards, when he interviewed you a number of years ago. And one of your quotes was that not one country in existence today has had the same borders and government for as long as 200 years. The world will continue changing. And so, Jim, looking ahead, what are some of the biggest changes in our borders that you think will happen? Well, it has always happened, and it is an accurate statement. Just get out your history books and look at maps of old maps of the world, and you will see that countries have always been changing. That's because the world is always changing. We're certainly, you know, if you look at a map of 50 years ago, there was the Soviet Union. There is no Soviet Union now. It was red China. There's no red China anymore. Uh, <clears throat> there's China, but it's a different government. It's a different everything now. So no, the world has always been changing. And what one needs to do 
is first be aware of it, but then more importantly, figure out how it's going to change in the future so that you can adapt. Watch the David Lamb report. He'll tell you. Uh, Jim, we, we know that the uh, BRICS nations are... Um working on potentially de-dollarizing and there's been talk since last year of even saudi arabia thinking about paying for their oil with the chinese yuan instead of using the dollar some might say this may be the end of the petrol dollar do you think that the dollar's future is in peril oh david in no currency has stayed on top for more than 100 150 years or so unfortunately <laughs> i say unfortunately because i'm an american my family are americans it's happening again. The U.S. has become the largest debtor nation in the history of the world. And the people in Washington are actually forcing people away from the dollar now. You know, in the past year or two, if the U.S. gets angry at you, they they put sanctions on you. They take your dollars away from you. Well, many people in the world are saying, wait a minute. That's not the way it's supposed to work. If we have a neutral moral currency, anybody can be able to use it for anything. But Washington doesn't play that way anymore. So many people are now almost frantically looking for something to compete with the U.S. dollar. If you know what it's going to be, David, please do not announce it on the air. Send me an email <laughs> because I need to know. We all need to know. I think you've been ahead of the curve for a long time now, Jim. What does the U.S. need to do to stay competitive economically, especially now with uh, rival nations like China competing on even the tech front? Well, there have always been nations competing. That's what history is, you know. Uh, four or five hundred years ago, shipbuilding was all in the Netherlands, and the, they were the best in the world at it. And then the British stole it from them, and the Scandinavians stole it from them. And, and the next thing you know, they're making ships in America because we stole it from the British. Uh, this has always been going on, rightly or wrongly, and it's happening again. The U.S. has had was a hundred years ago extraordinarily competitive in many many ways, but then we're not so competitive anymore, as you well know. Many countries can now produce many goods cheaper than we can, more efficient than we can. Is it good? Who knows? But it's certainly history. It's always been that way, and it always will be that way. Well, let me let me ask you this uh, this way. If you were to, if a younger person, let's say 18 years old, who is thinking of going to college, ask you, Jim, tell me, what do you think I should do with my life? Where should I move? What should I study? What should I basically do in order to have the brightest future possible? What would you say to that person? Well, David, if you want to do that, what you have to figure out is what you yourself love the most not what your friends or your teachers or your family loves the most, what you, what you are passionate about, and then pursue it. And if everybody laughs at you, you really should pursue it. You're really on the right track if people say you're nuts and you're doing the wrong thing. If you want to be a gardener, David, be a gardener, because someday you'll be listed on the New York Stock Exchange, and all of your friends will call you up and say they want a job. Why, why did you want to be an investor? You, you studied at Oxford, and then you decided to move into a few investment houses before starting at the Quantum Fund. Did you find a passion for investing during your studies, or perhaps was it something that you discovered after you graduated? Well, no, it was after I graduated. I was a confused college student, like many of them are. You know, I was going to go to law school, medical school, business school. I didn't have a clue. And quite by chance, uh, I got a summer job on Wall Street because I liked the guy and he liked me. And I fell in love. Here was a place that they would pay me to know what was going on in the world. I didn't realize when I was 20 years old that my passion was the world. I found out. I mean, many 20-year-olds don't know what their passion really is. Uh, but I found out I didn't go to law school or medical school or business school. As soon as I could, I went to Wall Street because I knew this is what I loved. And they will pay me. Oh, my gosh, they'll pay me to do it. You've had a very long and storied career in the investment industry. If you were to go back in time and give the 20-year-old some investing advice, <laughs> what would you say? 
figure out what you love. If you want to be a gardener, don't let them laugh at you. Do it, do it, do it. The problem is most people, or many people, never figure out what they really love. And if they do, David, they're afraid. They say, oh, gosh, I cannot do that. I don't know anything about that. Uh, whatever it is, uh, but that's really what you should pursue. Because you'll never go to work. You'll wake up every day and have fun. And that's who, those are the people who are the most successful in life. And even if you're not successful, David, you don't care. You're happy. You don't care about success. You're very happy every day. And that's more important. You know, one thing that's um, one trend that we've noticed that's interesting is that over the course of the last few decades, people, especially in the West, have had more and more leisure time. And that's time they spend on entertainment, not work or pursuing other endeavors. And, um, you know, going back to your point about doing what people love, a lot of people don't know what they love. And so people watching this right now are probably wondering, Jim, how do I find out what I love? <laughs> because I'm spending most of my time watching TV or a program like this to learn, but you know, I haven't found my passion yet because there's so much leisure time. Well, that's what I said. That's what I said. Many people never find it, or even if they do find it, they're afraid of it, or they don't realize that, that they should pursue it. I mean, I don't know how you find it. If you go into a doctor's office and there are 500 magazines, which ones do you read? Do you read about sports or fashion? Well, what, do you, what are your passions? You can probably figure out, looking at your own life on a day-to-day -day basis, how you spend your time. Well, that's where you should start. And if it's something, if you say, oh, my gosh, I can't. I, I read about fashion all, every time. Pursue it. Pursue it. Get a job at Saks Fifth Avenue. You can work your way up. Don't be afraid. Many people are afraid, even if they stumble on what they love or they're afraid to pursue it because other people say, you're crazy. Some people watching this now are no doubt passionate about investing. Now, they're probably wondering, Jim, if I were to look at a bank's balance sheets, how do I know that this bank is solid and perhaps not going to collapse like Silicon Valley Bank or perhaps get taken over by like, like Credit Suisse? You know, are there certain uh, metrics or indicators that would point to you that this particular financial institution is healthy enough for you to invest? Well, you ask a very, very good question. That's about a month's worth of shows, David. You know, we I can't answer that overnight because um, if it were that easy, we wouldn't have any more failures, would we? Everybody would see them coming and they would they would do something about it. You know, there are metrics. There are things that you can look at. I mean, that particular bank, as you may know, they took their all their bonds and they put them um, all the money into longer term bonds. Well, I don't, we, we don't have time for a bond market lesson here, but if you own longer term bonds and interest rates go high, those bonds are going to go down. It's a very, very simple lesson. They did it. I mean, anybody watching knew, and that's why there started to be a run on the bank, because many people knew, oh my gosh, these people have put their money in long term bonds. Interest rates are going higher. They're losing their shirt. So they took their money out. These are simple things. These are some simple things. I didn't say it was easy, David. I just said they're simple things. You brought up a good point, which is rising interest rates, which is partly to blame for the bank's failures. Now, what do you think the Federal Reserve is going to do next? They've already raised, just last week, 25 basis points. And inflation has come down, but not quite at their 2% level yet. Do you think more rate hikes are in order? Well, I know they are. You know, David, in the 70s, we had this kind of inflation, only worse. America was still a creditor nation in the 70s. Now we're the largest debtor nation in the history of the world, et cetera, et cetera. There was a Soviet Union. There is no Soviet Union anymore. I could go on and on. But here we are. It's going to be worse this time. In 1980, 1980 interest rates on short-term treasury bills 90-day treasury bills were over 20%. That's not a typo, David. Interest rates on government treasuries were over 20%. It's going to get very bad before it's over. Was there any incentive to invest in the stock markets if you're making 20% just in the, in the treasury market, Jim, back then? Why take on the extra risk? Well, a lot of people did exactly what you say, yes. 
Uh, if you could get 20% in treasury bills, many people did it. The problem is that that doesn't last because, you know, when you get 20% on treasury bills, many people put their money in treasury bills and so the rates come down. Yeah, absolutely. Some people have said that we are in a pre-election year, so the year before an election. And in the past, historically, pre-election years have done reasonably well. The governments have found ways to stimulate the economy in one way or another. Uh, what about this time, Jim? Do you think that uh, this could be a good year for the stock markets? Could be. Of course it could be. It could be. And you, you, but you, more importantly, but you pointed out some pretty simple facts, but straightforward, yes, usually... In the third year of a presidential term, stocks are not terrible. Stocks are usually pretty good. And that's because everybody knows there's an election coming the next year. So they sort of hype everything up to get ready so that they can win the next election. Here we are again. I don't know if it's going to happen again, but it always has. So I would suggest there's probably a pretty good chance it will happen again. Is it good for the world? No, it's not good, but they don't care about that. They care about their jobs, David. They don't care about you and me. Well, I, uh, hopefully that one day that'll change, but I, I suppose you're right. You can't change human nature. Uh, Jim, you've been known to uh, stay away from the herd. You've said that that has made you money in the past. Do you think that there is one particular sector right now in which the herd is overcrowded? Well, most stocks around the world have been very strong for a long time. In the U.S., it's been 13, it 13 years, yeah, 14 years since we've had a serious bear market. That's the longest in American history. <clears throat> Doesn't that mean it has to come to an end, David, but it always has after such a long run. So we're certainly getting closer to the end of this run. Probably next year will be a bad year. And, um, maybe, and even, maybe even before, but certainly historically, it would indicate the next year will be a bad year. I'm curious, actually, you're, you're based in Singapore right now. How is the economy in Asia? People are talking about here in North America, a recession. How about in Asia? Well, things are pretty good in Asia. Uh, China has slowed down, but China closed down during the, the virus, as you know, but now they've opened up, so things are getting better there. Asia is not bad. Uh, I didn't say it was good, great everywhere, but for most, the most part, the Asian economy is pretty strong. It's a good place to be. Jim, if you were to pick one emerging market within Asia to invest in today, where would that be? I would say I would say invest in Uzbekistan. That's probably the best. You you're asking about Asia. You're asking about emerging markets. Uzbekistan is probably the best I know. Is that because of their minerals? Well, that's partly. As Uzbekistan has staggering uh, resources of many kinds, tourist resources, nature agriculture, metals, minerals, um, but they were ruined by the Soviets. The new government in Uzbekistan is running things the way you and I would run them, or trying to, so, and it's unknown. Most people couldn't find Uzbekistan on a map. That doesn't mean it's great, but I, you asked me for an emerging market in Asia, I would say Uzbekistan. And uh, you're known to also pick investments that you think are hated, and oh so cheap. Do anything, does anything stand out that could fit that category today? It's hated and cheap. I don't know. I know. No, I don't. Agriculture, I guess, is hated and cheap in much of the world. Um, I cannot think of anything else right now. You know, it's been a huge amount of money burning for so many years. And it's when you have long long periods of money printing, things usually get more expensive, and that has happened in most assets around the world. Uh, well, tech stocks, for one, I'm just throwing something out there off the top of my head. Tech stocks, cryptocurrencies have all, most of them have collapsed. Some have dropped more than 90% in value since their 2021 highs. Uh, you know, if you were to just look at valuations, would you consider things that have dropped in value cheap, or would you say that maybe it's just a value trap, I'll still stay away? Well, if you know what you're doing, don't stay away. Jump in if you know what you're doing and you know the tech stocks, to use your term. Uh, if you know the cheap ones that are underpriced, by all means invest. I don't know much about technology, so I rarely invest in technology. But if you know what you're doing, don't listen to me. Do it, do it, do it. 
All right. Final question for you, Jim. Um, you've traveled all over the world, much to the envy of every, you know, everybody listening to this. You've written books about it, too. Investment biker, adventure capitalist. What is your favorite country that you've traveled to? The country that you think has made the most impact on you for opening up your eyes to a new way of life? Well, I guess I would have to be China just because in, in my recent lifetime, China's been a staggering change. You know, China went from a poor, backward nothing to the most successful country in the world. And it's huge. So I guess it would have to be China just based on the facts alone. But that's those, that's, that's not some preference. That's just fact. <laughs> but look out the window and see what's happening. You will see that China has become an astonishing success story. First time I went to China, it was a disaster. And I I have seen it change, but so has everybody else. Jim, I... David, by the way, if you ask me that question in 40 years, it would probably be something else. It might be Uzbekistan. It might be North Korea. Who knows? I, actually, it's interesting you brought that up. Um, Goldman Sachs made a projection that India will be the largest economy in the world by, I think, 2070 was their projection. I, I don't know. Have you been to India? Many times, yes. I have I have invested there several times, both long and short. I have no investment, either long or short, in India at the moment. Okay. But I will say, David, if you could only visit one country in the world, it should be India. It's an astonishing tourist country. There's nothing like it. Man-made sites, natural sites. As you know, the women are always winning the beauty contest, the food, the religious. Oh, my gosh. You walk down the streets, and it's fantastic. Don't don't forget the elephants as well. That's a nice... And that's the a, elephants. <laughs> that's and the lions. Attraction. And the tigers. Um, a final question, I'll let you go. What was your favorite motorcycle that you used uh, traveling around? Well, I always rode BMWs because BMWs, in theory, were the best engineered motorcycles, and I'm a hopeless mechanic, so I needed something that was reliable because uh, I am useless, useless when it comes to things mechanical. Uh, well, I hope to be inspired by you one day, get a motorcycle, a BMW, uh, or maybe a Honda, and uh, ride around the world and uh, relive some of the adventures you wrote about in uh, Adventure Capitalist, Investment Biker. Thank you so much, Jim. I really appreciate your time and uh, for educating us and our audience. I'll see you in Uzbekistan. I'll see you in Uzbekistan. We're in India. Thank you, Jim. India. Thank you, David. It was fun. Let's do it again sometime. Yes, Thank absolutely. You. Best of luck to All you. Right.